Welcome, Shubhir Chaudhary, to the Upgraded Executive Podcast. Thank you so much for featuring me. No, it's great. It's great to have you here. Oh, my pleasure. Shubhir, could you give the audience um, an insight into your background and, in particular, your journey from Bangladesh to the U.S.? I came to the United States in uh, 1991 as a master's degree uh, to do my master's degree in industrial management. I joined uh, GM uh, as an engineer. At that time, GM, Ford, and Chrysler has three different quality standards. And my curiosity was, why can't they have one quality standard? So that was the time um, I kind of got involved into American Society for Quality, uh, Automotive Industry Action Group. So ultimately, with a big uh, GM, Ford, Chrysler uh, leadership team and the support, we established uh, something called QS9000, which became a common quality standard around the world for all automotive suppliers to achieve. And at that time, there is no book out, nothing was available. So that was the time, and I was only 27 year old at that time. So my first book came out called um, QS9000 Pioneers. And, um, and that changed my life. When the book came out, uh, one of my goal was, um, you know, every quality giant living at that time, if they can review the manuscript and if they can endorse the, uh, book, as well as uh, Harvard, MIT, and University of Chicago faculty can review that book. You have to understand that is my first book. And what that did, when that book came out, um, basically J.D. Power, you know, I'm sure you heard of J.D. Power. Uh, they give the Automotive Quality Award. So J.D. Power uh, came in in my book launching ceremony. Japan's Dr. Taguchi came in. Uh, Philip Crosby, uh, one of the American giant in quality, came in. All of them came in to launch my book. And, and then J.D. Power said, you know, Shubir will be defining quality in automotive industry. Then my mentors like J.D. Power, Dr. Taguchi, all those, Philip Crosby, they kind of told me that, Shubir, if you really wanted to make a difference, then you have to uh, kind of leave the typical corporate job and you start as a consultant. So I said, I'm so young, you know, I don't have enough experience. He said, no, you'll fail. But once you learn from your failures, you will become, you know, so that is the way that my journey started. And then I never looked back. And ultimately, you know, I uh, then became more interested in um, senior management and the leadership. Then I collaborated with a lot of the world's top thought leaders like Marshall Goldsmith, uh, CK Prahlad, some of the world's top people into, um, you know, in the how to bring the quality to the leadership. <clears throat> so then, you know, then I have more book came out and every single book came out, became a bestseller. A lot of them became international bestseller. And based on that, in fact, uh, very honestly, after my QS 9000 pioneers in 1999, <clears throat> one of the book came out and the, my first publisher is, and that's why I'm very grateful to um, London in Britain, Britain, because it came out from Financial Times and uh, it's called the book called the uh, Management 21C. And that book became the Europe Business Book of the Year in 1999. Uh, and that changed me and, you know, that change also put me kind of one of the world's top management thinker. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you know that I was recently recognized by Thinkers 50 since 2011, uh, one of the world's top management thinker. So <laughs> my life has always been um, kind of motivated by the curiosity <clears throat> of the organization, curiosity of the challenges by the client. And that literally... Uh, went in and you know you saw my latest book you know the difference that is my 15th book so I have like around seven or eight international bestseller my book even translated more than um, you know 20 languages and uh, several books sold a million copies um, so life is good you know so th then I became on the process one of the uh, top management consultant you know so 15 books I some undertaking I've written one book and that was that was that was hard so I take my hat off to you writing 15 books it's incredible thank you recently uh, one of the automaker in the US um, they um, they call me they have a major recall uh, this is almost like four or five years ago major recall happened that recall they made an analysis that recall with the lawsuit government fine everything else will cost them close to $2 billion, $2 billion, right? So this automotive CEO called me and told me that, Shubir, I want you to save me $2 billion. I said, $2 billion, can I find $2 billion waste in your company? And this company is like over 100 or $200 billion 
automotive company. So I is a global automotive company. So I said, can I find $2 billion worth of waste? And the CEO told me that you can find $10 billion worth of waste. So think about it. $10 billion worth of waste I'll find. So, so I said, where I'll find those $10 billion worth of waste? She's like the CEO said, the way we run the organization, there is so much of complex, so many processes are broken. So ultimately, long story short, I got engaged. So what we did, we used the process. In fact, you know, I have a book called The Ice Cream Maker uh, book, you know, The Ice Cream Maker. So on this book, I introduced a concept called Leo, Listen, Enrich, Optimize is a three-step process. So that process, we applied all these functions. Long story short, instead of three years saving $2 billion, I've saved that company three and a half billion. Three and a half billion dollars I saved them in 18 months. And the amazing part is, we also taught them how to fish because one of my major strength is, I don't want to stay in a company. I have so much of demand. I don't have a stay in a company forever. So what we do, we teach our client how to apply those methodology. So we trained them for 18 months. What happened was their people became certified. My client people became certified. After we left the organization, they reported after we left, two years after we left, those people we trained without our help, they reported now it gave them $9 billion in three years. How do you define quality, Shubhia? So I think lots of the audience will have different views on what quality means. But what does quality mean for you? Um, it's an excellent question because quality is such a topic as a word itself is a very subjective, right? So quality means in my mind is uh, much more uh, that you have to think is the two things I talk about. It is basically people power and the process power, right? So quality is the combination of people power and the process power. That is the fundamental about the quality. Uh, but I think, you know, so let me explain a little bit of the people power. People power is much more like um, quality, unfortunately, is a kind of a word that corporation in any country in the world used as much more like the quality department job rather than as a not everybody's job. But ideally, quality should be involved from the, the person is a janitor to all the way to the CEO. So if the quality does not belong to all of them, then you cannot achieve quality. So the, the main, main thing would be every single individual in any organization work, either is a small company or is a large company, all must have that type of mindset to having a, um, like to have the responsibility of owning quality, right? So that is the people power side. Now, the process power side, what I call about, so if you really think about it, Ideally, if there is no problem happen, right, then we don't talk about the word quality. If everything is perfect, we don't talk about quality, right? So, so what happened is that if I define you, it's very simplistic. If I define you, every, every organization have lots of work, right? Like there's a lot of work. So in your field or my field or a doctor or you know, in NHS or, or, a, you know, um, or a corporate CEO, doesn't matter what is your function. All of us have some work. Now, every work, there is a process, right? Every, if there is a work, there is a process. Now, if there is a process, then there is a variation, right? There is a variation. So what I mean by that, suppose you invited me today at um, 10 a.m., right, to my Los Angeles time to talk to you. I might have been showed up at 9.55 a.m. or I may have show, showed up at 10.05 a.m., right? Now, the problem is if I showed up at 10.05 a.m., now I'm wasting both uh, your and Ben's time of that five minutes. So I have to be respectful about that, right? So I have to be, doesn't matter if my technology work or not, doesn't matter. I have to be respectful about that, right? So I have to make sure that, you know, can I be there at 10 a.m.? So I have to do everything in my power to do that, within that. So that I take that as a responsibility. So every process, there's a variation. So suppose if that variation, if I came at 10 or 5, both you and Ben should have been annoyed. Both you and Ben should have been said, what the heck? He preached quality and he didn't show up in time. <laughs> you got my point? So yeah, yeah. a lot of the time, a lot of the time that process is broken. So every individual, whatever work they do, they have to continuously think about, is my, am I doing everything right? On that process. So if they, if every person in an organization, only whatever work they are doing, they are doing the process right, 
automatically quality will become the byproduct. You will get the quality. So that is the major definition of my side of quality. But now, as you know, um, quality is also uh, defined by a lot of the time. Think about when I look at a Rolls Royce or when I look at a Bentley, right? Um, that kind of define as an appeal, like a that excitement feature. So a lot of the time, a lot of the fantastic innovation comes out of like, I hope even the reason I mentioned about uh, Bentley and uh, and roles because I hope for cost purpose they should not reduce their quality with respect of the material quality, right? Because that's what those brands stand for. So if they if they take it out and replace their all the metal stuff with the plastic, it will not. It is then it will it will not be Rolls Royce and and Bentley anymore, right? So so you know so there is some kind of a subjective type of appeal type of quality as well. But traditionally, uh, quality I kind of feel that it is a byproduct of doing the all the processes right by all the people within an organization. Brilliant. So it is a long answer, but. Ideally, it is much more like a quality is a combination of the people power and the process power. So those people at all level, you know, practicing the process properly, all processes properly, that will help. I just wanted to say something for the audience because they're probably thinking, hmm, I wonder if Shubia did join the call at 9.55, and he did, absolutely, on the money. <laughs> 9.55, he was there. <laughs> so trust the process. Right, right. Writing 15 books still boggles my mind. But when I was doing some of the, some of the research on your background, it seemed like some of your earlier books were really focused around Six Sigma and the whole thing around process improvement, process optimization. Could you just give some background into that field and how it's sort of developed over time? Because as we were talking about before the call, Six Sigma is a word that, yeah, certainly three or, three or four years ago, I was hearing a lot, but I certainly don't hear it so much anymore. So um, so let me tell you that Six Sigma is literally, if you really think about in 1970s and 80s, that whole total quality management, that was the name was there, right? So, but one of the things what Six Sigma did is, uh, especially in, I believe, I give a lot of credit to a gentleman um, named Jack Welch, like, because when he adopted Six Sigma in GE, he personally take the responsibility and he personally lead is a, is a much more like a management strategy. So he felt if I wanted to do any management strategy that Six Sigma, I personally have to be trained myself. And then what he did, he also uh, trained all of level type of people into the methodology and he personally championed it himself. Problem is, then it became very popular because he was talking about he's saving billions of dollars, he's making the product better and all this stuff. Because as soon as it became popular, then what happened? Everybody wants to do Six Sigma. The problem is, then problem is, then there's a thousands of consulting firm came out, out of that. And the sad part is, the consulting firm, they focused on the client's money rather than they focused on to do the methodology correctly. And being a consultant, I, if you ask me, I, I blame my own profession to damage the methodology because unfortunately, human characteristics, we wanted to make the money by hook or crook rather than they, even though they are preaching quality, but they don't practice quality. So because of that, what happened is that most of the consulting firm, they took the client without getting the 100% commitment from the CEO, right? So if you ask me, do I have any Six Sigma deployment that where I failed? Answer is zero. None. Every one of them is successful. Why? Because I did not take the client unless the CEO is 100% committed. So even today, if you call me and saying that after listening to your podcast, NHS want to do it, something, right? And wanted to use this methodology, either Six Sigma or process improvement. Problem is, if the the CEO or the if the number one person of NHS does not meet with me and give me the 110% commitment, he or she is going to lead that effort. I'll say, sorry, I'll not take you as a client. I have a situation after I save one of the automaker that, you know, uh, three and a half billion dollars, another automaker CEO called me and told me if I can say, do the same thing for him. And after I meet with that automotive CEO, after a one hour meeting, I just told him, that he personally has to champion. And he said he doesn't have any time. I said, thank you very much. So I was leaving. He said, are you telling me if I give you a $50 million contract, you'll work out? 
I said, yes, yes, sir. He said, what do you mean? I said, that's what I mean. I'll walk out because I want your championship. Otherwise, it is going to fail. So when you are asking why Six Sigma did not stick, in fact, I was invited in China um, to come in by the government of China as their guest to come in to meet with the Chinese business leaders to why Six Sigma is failing almost 99% of the organizations in China. Problem, what I told them is that because none of them is led by CEO. So if it is not led by the CEO, doesn't matter what the processes are, you cannot achieve, you cannot so you'll get maybe 5% or 10%. So think about the G is a classic example. Even though Jack Wells did it, it worked. As soon as Jack retired, Jeff email came. Within three to four years, his focus is completely different. He wants to grow the G so big, so quickly. And he did not champion on the what Jack Wells put there with respect of Six Sigma. So right now, I really wonder that I don't have the data per se, but I really wonder if it is really, because all the problem GE is having now, if it is done Six Sigma right, they should not have those problems. So after that CEO left, if the next CEO does not embrace it, it will still, the organization will suffer. So I think, you know, so one of the thing, you know, like if you ask me, did we deliver results in Six Sigma? Absolutely. Doesn't matter what we call it now, but the key is, we can come up with a new name, right? Now, the popular name is operational excellence, right? New name is fine. But the problem is the major ingredient of any of this methodology has to be led by CEO. Like, look at Japan. Japan was one of the poster child of quality in the world. Japan is the reason America, England, all of those Western countries started adopting when Japan is capturing the market share and taking the market share away from US, UK, France, and all those countries. Now, look at today's Japan. Today's Japan doesn't have the similar type of quality mindset what their grandparents had, right? So Japan is also, Toyota is not the same quality what it used to be like maybe 20 years ago, right? <clears throat> so again, the reason is that because it is not led by the senior leadership. So that, that would be my, so, but if you ask me like, uh, I can give you some example of uh, one of the companies we did Six Sigma called Caterpillar. You know, it was led by the chairman of the board. Um, we we make Caterpillar. Um, when they hired us, they want us to save, uh, save them uh, by doing Six Sigma $250 million in 18 months. We saved them close to billion dollars in 18 months. Uh, they wanted to grow their revenue from 20 billion to 30 billion in 10 years. And after 10 years, their revenue growth from 20 billion to became 42 billion. Why? And I, I take zero credit, zero. Why? 100% goes, credit goes to the client CEO. See, because they are the running the organization, right? So, you know, and I say the same thing, even political leaders. Unfortunately, you know, political leaders, when they're running a country, they have to, if they become the president or prime minister of a country, they have the 100% accountability of that country's economic economic growth, right? Or if any other problem happen, it is their responsibility. Otherwise, you should not take that position, right? So, you know, and, and so unless the CEO and the senior leadership completely behind it, it doesn't matter what I call it, it is going to fail. So that is my experience, you know. But if you ask me, did Six Sigma deliver? Absolutely. The companies which did it correctly, absolutely it will deliver result, you know. Brilliant. So, in your experience, Shubir, which are the companies that most people would have heard about are really leading the way now in terms of operational excellence? Uh, one of the things I believe that recently operational excellence, one of the masterful job is done by, believe it or not, even an old company is General Motors, GM. They did one of the masterful job because uh, in operational excellence because uh, it is led by Mary Barra. And she's one of the finest leader, fine, even though she is the first female automotive leader, you know, but still, in fact, which is kind of funny, like, um, I think two days ago, uh, President Obama was uh, giving a speech in, uh, basically is interviewed in Singapore. And he kind of, I read it today, it became a big news in the US newspaper. He mentioned something very profound. He said, if every nation in the world is run by women, 
every nation in the world, if it's run by women, right? He believed, President Obama believed, they will deliver better results. They will deliver better results for a, uh, at least for next two to five years, right? And, and there is some profoundness into it, you know, because what I've seen with a person like Mary Barra, what she did in General Motors is absolutely stunning, right? Even the culture change, the way she did the culture change, uh, how she led the whole effort herself is, is absolutely brilliant. So I, I feel that is one of the major uh, companies that who did a fantastic job in recent years. So your first 14 books were very much around process and process improvement and then your last book the difference which i have a copy here check this book out guys brilliant book um loads of great insights but this book's very different to your previous books yes Shubia. Yes. can you just explain why see uh, uh, so for an example uh, the one of the company example i gave you that uh, i was telling you about uh, saving uh, like a three and a half billion or nine billion dollars right on that company, right? I told you about that company. Yeah. Now, that particular organization, if you ask me today, Shubir, can you confidently say this company 20 years from today or 50 years from today will not become bankrupt? And I will say, no, I cannot confidently tell you, even though I help them. So then the question comes to, why is that? Very honest with you, that difference is written because of that. Because what happened was, I feel that if any organization at the end of the day, you can have the best process in place, but if the people are not the, have the caring mindset, which I talked in the difference book, that means if every person does not care, right? If, if the people still have the tendency to hiding the information under the rug, right? Or they have the fearful culture or, you know, because they are always, or they are managing up very well, but not managing all level well all those things doesn't ha happen, then what will happen would be that the process will fail. Even the best process will fail, right? So even these companies, I help them. But can I tell you confidently, every person on that company has the caring mindset. Answer is no. Not even 50% of the employees have caring mindset. So what that help tells me is that, so when I look back, I kind of felt, I said, everything I've done in last 25 years is piece of crap. I felt... <laughs> problem belongs to me, right? Problem belongs to me. So even though I was in the height of my career and I kind of challenging myself, I said, if I'm the organizational teacher, if I'm the responsible to make their quality better, oh my God, why I didn't fix the people fast? Because I have to pe put the people fast before I fix the process. So one of the ideal, so if you ask me, did I have any ideal client yet? I think the ideal client would be, they should, they should, put the difference fast, they should implement the difference fast, then they should implement ice cream maker because they have to fix the people, right? So the, I, so the whole idea about the difference is, and in fact, the subtitle talked about when good enough is not enough, right? So basically, every single individual, they have to have what I feel as a caring mindset. And so let's talk about what is caring mindset. Basically, I talked about the four human attributes. And very honest with you, anybody can practice. You can practice. You don't need to hire me to practice that. It's very, but it is a mindset. You have to have that mindset to achieve that. So basically, I talked about the fourth principle is called a star. It is stand with straightforward. T stand for thoughtful. A stand for accountable. And R stand for resolve. So, so if you really take those three, like those four words, is even if you ask me today, Shubir, how you score your own self in a star? So if 10 is the best number, like the highest number, and zero is the lowest, can I confidently tell you all these four, I can score 10 out of 10? Answer is no, because none of us are perfect. And we cannot be perfect, right? So even big, so I can be phenomenal in accountability today. I may score myself seven or eight, but tomorrow I might score three because every single day, um, I may not be perfect, right? So it is a continuous thinking of a striving for it, for those four principles, right? So for an example, when I talk about a straightforward, one of the things what I find is, doesn't matter is in Asia or in Europe or in America or South America, doesn't matter, or Australia, any of those countries, majority of the companies, they're so afraid 
to their bosses. So a lot of the time, they are not telling the truth. They are not, because if they tell the blunt truth, they might be punished, right? That fear culture is there. So unless the leaders create an atmosphere, no, you can talk from your heart and mistake is okay, but you have to make sure you learn from the mistake. If you don't create that culture, if you don't become a straightforward, nowadays, majority of the companies, if you become a straightforward, I think you get punished. So unless you create that culture and to achieve that, it's not that easy. It's very, very tough, right? To, to create that culture, right? So that is, the, that is the first one. The second one is I talked about the thoughtful. Thoughtful is much more like um, just caring for the other individual, right? So a lot of the time we can become competitive, but when our our peers are failing, uh, we, like, or even if I screw up, we have a tendency to point finger each other as if it's not my fault. Everybody else is somebody else's fault. And that is one of the things happening in America, unfortunately. Look at an America as a country, I'm very honest with you, that is suffering because both the parties, like a Democrat and Republican, fighting each other, and they are not putting America first. They are not. They are giving the lip service of America first. But none of those parties putting the nation first. Recently in your country, Boris Johnson was elected by the people. He is elected by the people. But after that, within two days after the election was done, even if got the majority, the other party, they are saying they are protesting the whole, uh, you know, London um, in Piccadilly and everywhere. They are protesting in the masses saying that Boris Johnson is not our prime minister. What is that crap? He's elected by the people. Right. So if, if you don't embrace that, even if you lose, sometimes you lose, sometimes we win. But you, can, you still have to embrace the losing proposition. Right. So it's not that in life, everything I win. Sometimes I lose. But when I lose, I have to appreciate and respect my colleagues or whomever I'm losing to and understand that and to learn from it. And then I go up and try to again uh, win that. You know, that should be the spirit. Not that talk, whoever owned, I don't need to talk him down. And that's what is happening in the world, which is very sad in political perspective. But in organizational perspective, the similar thing can happen. So we have to be thoughtful to each other. The other perspective is the accountability. A lot of the time, you know, even in our country, believe it or not, in America, uh, one of the things, you know, Donald Trump may not be, you know, obviously he has a lot of flaws with respect of, some of the word and how he do it and all this. He has a lot of flaws. But saying all this, he's still making a lot of the areas he's making people accountable, which is very out of the box. And that is making a lot of people very uncomfortable, right? But he's delivering like a lot of, like even him, he's the first president ever in last 30 years or 40 years I know of took China trade, you know, such a strong way, right? And nobody has the guts to take China that way. No leaders in the world has the guts to take China that way. But he did, right? And he's doing it for the, for the nation, for the country. Now, because of that, he was not popular. A lot of the things is happening because of his style or leadership style. But the problem is that that accountability should be leadership's business, right? Each of us as an individual should feel accountable for it, right? So for an example, you invited me. I didn't show up on time and I come up with an excuse and cancel it at last moment, I should be accountable for it. What, suppose if any emergency happened, suppose I became sick, I have to write a very profound apology to both of you because you block your time and I have to be respectful for that time, right? So, but that is missing in society nowadays. That is missing. These are a small thing, but this count, right? If you go to somebody, you tell them, doesn't matter what busy, even if an emergency happened, you immediately tell them, hey, look, I have an emergency happen. I'm very sincerely apology. I wanted to make it up, right? But nowadays, we are not doing those norms. Those are very important. So accountability is also very critical. The, the fourth part is the resolve. A lot of the time, we take projects, we do things, but we just do a half-done job, but ultimately, we don't finish the product, finish the job properly. So any project you start, if you don't finish it, then don't take the project. You feel accountability. And so if you think about these four characteristics, every single individual is practicing in an organization. The quality will automatically deliver. Automatically, the profit will come. Revenue will grow. Because that is the idealistic. That is the reason I came up with this book about you know, how any one of us can make a difference. Brilliant. 
do you do much work with um, leadership CEOs around, I guess, spirituality, their own ir- inner essence? And because my my belief is our our core is love, and when people align their their words and actions with their inner essence, then they're happy. And if you're working with a CEO entrepreneur at the top of the organization if they're happy in themselves that has a positive effect top down and alignment around values i mean it might be a bit different if it's if it's a corporation in terms of realigning the values with i guess the the management um but do you think there's something in that in terms of i guess what you're talking around evolved or 2.0 with mixing in that spirituality aspect <laughs> so no i think there's a brilliant question a uh, brilliant question um i think yes uh, some of those like i gave you an example of mary bara for an example in gm is a very yes. very um uh, uh, hierarchical uh, and a uh, very complex organization very large organization but one of the beauty about her is that she has spent also the time to the floor level people and putting her hand on the shoulder of the of the workers right she goes out and in a meeting when she comes in it basically is out so for an example you know in general motors um, corporate culture you um, you know no ceo before mary even wear a jeans in the c suite when they go to the office but on the first time uh, you know on the first weekend on a friday first friday of her when being she being a ceo she showed up with a jeans and as soon as that happened people are shocked and she was saying that am i looking bad no it's a friday today right so based on that what happened is that the next weekend like next friday every single leaders came up with a jeans right so that became their culture so i always felt that you know um i i i think as you know that spirituality is a much more like a personal belief and personal experience um some leaders have it some leader doesn't have it and i think um it will be very difficult especially in a large corporation if it's a small car organizations if you bring some spirituality you can touch the other people you can talk passionately about it but um in a large organization if you bring that in it will be very difficult to penetrate across the whole organization and you might be misunderstood people may think you are crazy or whatever right in especially in the western culture and all uh and i think in asian culture it would be much more easier because uh you know it is that is the way so in india if the ceo is a spiritual it's great right but in a western culture if your ceo is a spiritual they think you are you have something problem right you know so i think uh, but saying that saying that it especially in large companies but if it is a smaller organization yes you can talk about it your feeling and what is the main purpose one of my major favorite absolutely favorite leader one of my most favorite leader was believe it or not is a british uh onita rodrick she passed away at the age of 64 you know the body shop founder right body shop founder um onita rodrick and every single penny 51 million pound her net asset when she passed away at the age of 64 100% of her whole asset she donated 100% of donated because she felt that in everything she has done why body shop became i don't know if you know she is one of the uh, you know she put the double decker buses uh, in london put the missing child children picture in the double decker buses and and then she said please find this child and then put the phone number and body shop will sincerely appreciate it think about it what a strategy right she used that in the bus but she was very sincere so i asked her that onita is your intent to capitalize to sell more body shop product or is the advertisement you are putting there missing child she said no 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 if that one child found out that will make me 1000 th- times more happier but guess what happened the world whole not only britain fell in love with body shop because she is finding those children right missing children is you know because of that advertisement the missing children is found not only british fell in love with her product the whole world love fell in love with her product because her intent is right so i think the intent part is very important right so even some of the ingredients she found um in 
in some African uh, countries in a absolutely uh, poorest of the poor villages. She found the women uh, are taking a shower and using some leaf, just a leaf um, in their bodies. And their skin is one of the best skin tone. So she, then she sent some of the world's top scientists to research on those, uh, those uh, leaves and to uh, come up with the product. Body Shop, Body Shop came up with the product because you know she's the one who also helped to test any of those product on the animal testing. You know She banned the animal test and she's one of the uh, major activists on that. So then once that product became successful, what she did, she went back to that village. She used her profit, majority of her profit, went to rebuild that village and gave them education. That is the, in my opinion, that is more than a spirituality. That's what more than humanity, right? Because, you know, I always, I'm a big believer of um, a Indian saint named Sami Vivekananda. And he talked about that if you wanted to serve God, you serve humanity. That is one of the reasons, uh, you know, even though I'm a Hindu, but I'm a big fan of Mother Teresa, right? Why? Because that's what she did. Right. So somebody can make an argument, you know, any of those type of famous people, they have always have some criticism, you know. So somebody may say, OK, she went there in India and promoted Christianity and all this stuff. Anybody have any right to say any criticism, but nobody can deny. Nobody can deny she saved millions of children in Calcutta and in India. Right. Nobody can deny that. So let us embrace that. In my opinion, that is true quality right so so i think the intent part is very important ben and i in some of our earlier episodes have really been focusing on around how do executives and leadership teams put themselves in the best possible place mentally emotionally physically because we feel as though when somebody's in a great place mentally emotionally physically they're, they're able to do the hard work and i guess with this example they have the energy to be able to come to work every day and have a quality mindset. Do you, you see any sort of common things that executives do? The first thing I think in, hum, in any human being, I kind of talk about um, our normal focus always been external customer, right? But I always tell them about, no, your focus should be internal customers. If you don't focus on internal customers, you may not be able to help or create the excitement of external customers. So what I mean by that? And my definition of internal customers means your spouse, your children, your loved ones, right? Because at the end of the day, every CEO come to home, right? And they have their loved ones, right? So if you're not having a good time and quality time with your loved ones, it's very difficult to, to create that quality atmosphere in the um, in the workplace, right? So that is number one. Number two is that the another type of internal customers is the employees, your internal employees, your direct reports, your all of your employees as a CEO, their their uh, happiness. So I think if you truly can really satisfy that, and what I've seen, a lot of the CEOs that who truly have those type of uh, mindset, they really made a difference. Yeah, and I, I love the love the analogy around internal customer because I really feel as though the most important internal customer is yourself. And by putting yourself in the best possible place, then you're in the best possible place then to look after your family, your career, your organization. See, one of the things, one, uh, one of my very good friend and leadership coach, Marshall Goldsmith, uh, one time asked me a very profound question. And he used to ask that question. He said, if you, today, if you die, if you die, drop dead, who will be the people you believe will be coming to your funeral? And who will be the people who will be really cry the rest of their life, right? And by missing you. And as you make that list, and if you don't give enough time to those people, those are the major internal customers. If you don't give the time, so for an example, I can save the $9 billion of that company. I think their CEO may not come to my funeral. I'm sorry to tell you, right? Because my relationship is very business relationship. They paid me money. I gave them the service. I made money too, right? But it's not that, it's not the same relationship with me and my son or me and my wife, right? Or my, me and my mother. 
right? Didn't have that relationship. The question would be, are you spending enough quality time with them? Because you, as a human, you get more energy from, from what you are doing with the internal customers. And that energy will drive you, right? If that energy does not have a, you know, have a lot of a stress on that. So for an example, I'm the very busy consultant, but whenever I'm in Los Angeles, um, I always drive my, um, you know, I drive my children in school because I felt that half an hour is the best quality time I can have with him or her, you know? So I think that is very important, right? Um, like my daughter uh, went to college and her passion is into literature, right? So guess what I did? I'm spending more time with American top laureates, right? Why? Because she's pursuing literature. So I thought how I can help. So I became more interested in literature and I'm trying to reach out to a lot of the laureates and trying to introduce her. As a father, I feel she may not appreciate now, but 20 years from now or 10 years from now, she may appreciate that's the best gift I gave it to her, introducing a lot of top laureates of America, right? But, so, but again, in my mind, that I felt that I have to say, what can I do for the people who will be attending my funeral? You know, which is very profound discussion, you know, and that's what you have to think of. Like a lot of the people you're working with, they are your internal customer. So you can be tough with them, but you still have to love them too. Because without them, like if you ask me why I became one of the top consultants, because of my people. If they did not support me, I could not achieve what I achieved. So I have to take care of them. Right. So I think that is also so sometimes you can be cutthroat, you can be very tough with them, but you also have to respect them. You also have to hug them when they perform. And that's what I think is very, very critical. So how can somebody take the star principles and build those into their personal lives? I always talk about leadership by doing like leadership by doing. So that means, you know, you cannot talk about this. What do you have to do? You have to practice it. So, for example, when I talk about a straightforward. As a leader, if I'm the CEO of a company, if I be very honest and if I talk the question to them and say, okay, so a prime example I can give you, when Alan Mulali uh, came to Ford Motor Company, the first day when he showed up, he, he received, um, he, he brought his whole leadership team. He came from Boeing and his job is to turn around Ford. I'm talking about uh, during the financial crisis time. So when Alan came in, that he brought. So he basically asked them a very simple question to the whole leadership team. Tell me, each of you, what is red, what is green, what is yellow? Red, yellow, and green. Tell me. And most of them telling him everything they showed it to him, every leader is all green. So he was saying, we are losing money, billions of dollars. We are in deep crisis. You are telling everything is, everything is uh, like a green. Are you out of your mind? So now that is the Ford culture. So he said, hey, look, this is the thing. I wanted to be very clear. My job as a CEO, I need to know the red. We collective can figure it out. But if you show me the red, I promise you, I'll never punish you. But tell us the truth. So then the first executive, his name is Mark, Mark Fields. He raised the hand and he said, okay, I have a red. And later on, when Alan left, Mark became the CEO of Ford when Alan left. But the point is, then he changed the whole culture because initially they have the fear factor. So I think the leaders stop anything you do, this type of stuff. I talk about a straightforward or thoughtfulness. Leader has to go, right? I cannot teach an executive how to become thoughtful, how to become to say if one of the colleagues, um, a spouse died. I cannot tell him, can you go there and to attend his funeral? I cannot say that to a CEO. Because that, that humanity you have to bring on your own. You have to, you, you know, so, so some of these principles I'm talking about, I think most of us have it. Most of us, somebody read a difference. You can practice without even consulting with me. Only thing, what do you have to do? You have to deep down think about it and you have to believe, is it really I'm practicing it? Once you have that, then you don't need any consultant to help you because you know those attributes, you can do it yourself. So I think a lot of the time when they read the difference, I tell them to kind of deep down think themselves and try to find the answer and try to work on those weaknesses. And if there's a private coaching is needed, they can come to me. 
But I think once they believe in it, then what they did, they passed that to next level leaders. And then next level leaders read the difference. Then they felt about it. And then they passed to the next level. That is the way I think this type of stuff is change happen. And last question, what um, three bits of advice would you give our audience, so executives, for upgrading their personal and professional performance? I think uh, the first question would be, um, be happy every single day. And how to become happy, everybody is different. But make that as a priority, right? Make that as a priority. Either at home or at workplace, be happy. Because I think we are living in a very stressful society. We are living in a very individualistic society. Um, I think life, I kind of feel that life is also, the, so that would be the first one is the happy. The second thing is dedicate your life, whatever you do for other human beings right? Dedicate your life for other human being with a sense that because the pleasure of getting other human being, making them happy, I wrote the difference. And believe it or not, the most satisfaction I get from the people I never ever imagined in my life, that they are saying that it made a difference in their life, which I is, and they are not corporate executive. That can be a high school student wrote me a phenomenal letter, right? Or like how this book made, book made a difference to them. So Think about do something for helping others because that is an unbelievable amount of gratitude you will get. So those are, that is the second point. And the third point, I kind of feel that the very important in life is the, the integrity. Make sure the foundation, foundation of life is all about having the highest integrity. Either at home or at workplace, if you have, your foundation is the highest integrity, then life would be good. So I think, and these three um, uh, points, I think, you know, if you really think about it, and all of them is kind of making choices type. Like think about, in fact, one of my book I'm writing is about making the choices. So you think about it. Do you want it to be unhappy or do you want it to be happy? Choice belong to you. Do you want it to help others or not help others? Choice belong to you. Thank you, Shubhia. That was a thank great you. interview. Really enjoyed that. Thank you very much for your time. I'd like to thank Shubhia for his time his insights and for sharing some amazing stories. If you like this episode, then please do check out our bonus recording with Shubia, which is all about the man that shaped his life. This is a brilliant recording with two fantastic stories. So do check it out on our YouTube channel. Remember, if you would like to access our content one week before it's released, please leave your details at www.upgradedexecutive.com forward slash subscribe and we will send you a special link so you can access the videos one week before we officially release them you can also follow us on all of our social channels at connect with ue